Good afternoon and welcome to the FCCJ. Um, I'll keep this very brief. As you know, there's a, an election taking place on Sunday, which Shinzo Abe is going to win. <laughs> 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 the end, no. <laughs> um, but here to provide a little bit more insight than myself are two very um, knowledgeable and insightful guests here at the FCCJ today. We have um, Tobias Harris, um, who's the a political risk analyst and vice president of the Washington-based Teneo, 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 Teneo Intelligence, and Professor Michael Kuchek, who's an adjunct professor at Temple University, Japan. Um, anyway, without any further ado, I'll just let them speak for a few minutes each, and then we're hoping to hold, of course, this is a press conference, so Q&A, but we'll try to make this more like a discussion today than a direct, you know, one-on-one -on -one Q and A type affair. So try to keep this, to keep a natural vibe going throughout the press conference. So um, first up, Tobias. Oh, and a warm round of applause, please. <laughs> Tobias. Andy, thank you for moderating our, our friendly little discussion, and to the FCCJ for hosting us, and to Michael, because we've basically been having an ongoing conversation about all of this stuff for now a decade, as hard as that is to believe, so it's, um, it's really a pleasure, and um, try to find some interesting things uh, in an election that, over the course of the last month, has become progressively, I guess, less... Um, less surprising compared to elections past. I mean, now it looks like, um, you know, now that we're, we're three days away, it, 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 we are looking like, like in 2014, where, where you're basically going to get a, a victory by default for Prime Minister Abe. And that's going to be, um, you know, for, for two kind of obvious reasons. Um, you know, one, turnout's going to be, I, I mean, I think signs are pointing to turnout being not all that much higher, if it's higher at all, compared to uh, 2014 when you had it fall seven points to a record low from the already record low in, tw in 2012 of 59% down to 52%. I don't think there's any reason to think that you're going to get more people out to vote. So um, that's as much a vote. You know, that's, you know, people not voting is as much of a statement as anything. And this is a statement, you know, people don't really like any of their options. Um, the other factor, of course, is that we now have um, the Democratic Party is now on its way out the door, and you have the Party of Hope and the Constitutional Democrats taking its place. And as a result, in most of the single member districts, you have multiple opposition candidates running against the LDP. And the LDP, in a lot of those districts, that maybe if it were a one-on-one -on -one race, you'd have closer races. The LDP is going to easily win uh, north of 200 of the, of the 289 seats. And so that, uh, already the LDP is starting with such an advantage because of that. Um, that you know, just in terms of looking at the forecast, it's not necessarily, uh, there's not going to be too many surprises. What is interesting, um, just when we look at the results, so aside from the fact that we know um, the LDP and Komoto in, in all likelihood will return with um, you know, an overwhelming majority and, and could very well and probably will uh, be above the 310 line needed for a supermajority. Uh, it, it will still be interesting to see what happens in the proportional representation seats where there actually, I think if you look at polls in the last couple of weeks, there actually has been movement. You've seen, I mean, the LDP is roughly where it's been the whole time. It's been at about 33%. That really hasn't changed. And actually, if you look at the 2014 results, that's exactly where the LDP was. So, um, you know, the LDP is pretty much, is pretty consistent where it's at in proportional representation. But you've seen, um, th you know, the Party of Hope has almost inexorably slipped, you know, week after week. Uh, and the Constitutional Democrats have risen um, quite dramatically, considering that uh, when the election was called, there was no, you know, did not exist. No one really knew what was going to happen with the left wing of the Democratic Party. And it's been, I think there's been a real, um, uh, a surprisingly positive response. I mean, not enough that you're going to see, I think, lots of extra voters turn out. I mean, I, th I think it's still just too early um, in the life of this, this new party. But I think we might end up in a position where this party that didn't exist a month ago could end up as the the second party and, and could do, I, I mean, I don't think it's going to, uh, you know, it's not going to top the LDP and PR by any means. But I mean, it, that we might see a surprisingly strong result um, from the Constitutional Democratic Party. So that, I mean, that's something to watch. And I think a lot of the questions that hopefully we'll talk about uh, over the course of, of this event will be, of what does the landscape look like? You know, that, okay, so Abe wins another election. You know, what does that actually mean for his power? What does it actually mean for how J Japanese democracy is gonna function? What's that gonna mean for some of the biggest policy questions, uh, constitutional revision? I mean, that's 
you know what we were all what we were hoping to discuss. So I'm going to pass it over to Michael now, having set the stage. But uh, um, well, thank you for that, and uh, I'd like to thank again the FCCJ for this opportunity to speak. Uh, I'd like to thank Tobias, whose idea this was, uh, and he asked me to come along, and I am very grateful uh, for his generosity. Uh, I agree, of course, with everything that he has said so far. I would like to uh, also extend a thank you uh, to Shinzo Abe, uh, not just for the fact that we are here today, uh, which we would not be if he had not decided uh, to somehow capitalize on the rise of his public opinion polls that took place, uh, not due to anything he, he did except pick a cabinet of rivals of persons who were uh, people who were his critics, particularly uh, uh, Kono Taro, uh, putting him in the foreign ministries. Uh, position. Uh, I think that virtually all of the rise that occurred in the after the selection of the cabinet was due to this ca this the attractiveness of this cabinet, and indeed we've seen some fall in the in the support levels uh, since he essentially pulled the plug on the cabinet by calling an election. Uh, now the uh, I do nevertheless uh, have a further reason to thank. Uh, Shinzo Abe, and that is uh, for bringing total clarity uh, in terms of Japan's political uh, environment. <laughs> and that would be a joke, except actually I think that what he has done has uh, had a tremendous effect in terms of uh, clarifying, at least for me personally, what the uh, cleavage lines are in Japanese politics, the real cleavage lines. Now. As someone who teaches political science, uh, I am uh, required to talk about left versus right, uh, left-wing politics versus right-wing politics. And inexorably, as you talk about that in the classroom, it seeps into your, your consciousness and divides the world that you live in. But I believe that uh, this election has shown that the borderline between left and right is not what divides Japanese politics. That you, is uh, shutting down nuclear power plants a left issue or a right issue? Well, the Hope Party, uh, which has a very strong right-wing uh, anti-Korean, anti-Chinese undercurrent in many of its members, is committed to shutting down nuclear power plants. So what's the, the, the political left-wing, uh, right-wing split there? And if you go through po policy after policy, in terms of, of in economic policy. The LDP is a right-wing conservative party. If you, have you looked at their economic program? <laughs> there is nothing more socialist than what they do. And indeed, all of these issues that would be dream issues for a social democratic party in Europe, womenomics, uh, a, a monetary policy which is based on, if you've got something to sell, we'll buy it. Uh, that kind of freewheeling uh, Keynesian, if you will, economic program is anathema to Europe's conservatives. But here, the conservatives, in quotation marks, are committed to an absolutely Keynesian program. What has happened in the last few days is, particularly in regarding the breakup of the DP, has clarified what I think are the true divisions in a Japanese society. And in that, the name of the new party that emerged out of this chaos is the Constitutional Democratic Party. And, and that comes from the term Riken, Riken Shugi, the belief in constitutionalism. It's not left versus right. It's idealists versus pragmatists. That is where it comes from. That is the division. The Riken Shugi, the, the, the Constitutional Democratic Party, is the party of the idealists. The LDP is the party of the pragmatists. That's why you see people like Ishihara Shintaro complimenting Edano Yukio for his manliness mm -hmm. in, the, in, a, in a sea of betrayal, in a sea of cowardice. Here's a man. And that's where you see Kobayashi Yoshinori, a supposedly far right wing uh, manga artist, campaigning for Tsujimoto Kiyomi in Osaka, on, on, standing together and saying, I'm a conservative. That's because he's an idealist. 
Ishihara, to a certain extent, is an idealist. They want an ideal politics, a manly politics in Ishihara's sense, which is kind of, that's where he's at. We, if you've read his oeuvre, he's into that in a big way. Uh, but thank you, Shinzo Abe. Thank you, for, for, at least for me personally, clarifying what the differences really are. And that is where w the, the outcome on Sunday will be uh, confusing. In the districts, as, as he noted, the LDP will romp. Because in a, in a district election, voters will vote rationally. They'll vote pragmatically. They'll vote for their own interests economically. What, they may like the other candidate. They may like the ideals of the other candidate. But they know the LDP candidate will deliver. But in the proportional vote, you can vote your dreams. You can vote your ideals. And that's where we'll see the real action. And it, if there's going to be a rejection of Abe Shinzo, it'll be in the proportional vote. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you both very much. on. Thank you both very much there. Hello. OK, so um, we'll open the floor up to questions now. Um, please give your name and your affiliation when you come up to speak. And keep your questions short, if you could. No long speeches. And if you could direct your question to one of the speakers, then as I said before, we'll kind of open it up for discussion between the, the pair. Um, Martin's got his hand up. <laughs> Martin Kölling, Handelsblatt. Uh, with all uh, yeah, the competition on the so-called conservative side, now we have the LDP, we have the Party of Hope, then uh, the Osaka Ishin yeah, Restoration Party, basically. What do you think are, is the, are the conflict lines between these conservative camps? Is it uh, centralism versus decentralism, or is it something else? And uh, how will this play out in the future? I mean, if you're looking at the cities, big cities are not run by the LDP anymore. Uh, but the country still is. So what does it mean for the political dynamics in Japan? So that would be, I mean, I think that is the second cleave. I mean, that, that in theory, there's another cleavage line that, I mean, I don't think we're quite getting there in this election because um, for, I mean, we can talk about the reasons why the Party of Hope uh, did not end up becoming uh, what it looked like it might become a month ago. But there, I mean, there is, I think, a real potential for an urban um, you know, an urban Chiho division, and, um, and and you know, and I think we all kind of laughed about the twelve zeros in the Party of Hope's manifesto. Uh, but you know, the, those urban quality of life issues. I mean, the voters really care about that, and you know, and, and that if you're, um, you know, and, and you know, the fact is, the LDP, you know, yes, they've been able to win in Tokyo, and they've won in the big cities, and and you know, because they win everywhere, um, you know, it, it obscures things, but. You know, you, you had, um, you know, the Party of Hope shows that, you know, there is a place for kind of an unabashedly urban party. And that there is, um, you know, that in addition to uh, the cleavage that Michael talked about, which I think is a great way of thinking about the difference between um, the LDP and, the, and uh, the Constitutional Democrats, there is also potential for challenging the LDP on a, uh, on a, a kind of urban rural split. You know, and the fact that the LDP, um, you know, spends so much of its time talking about Chiho um, Sose, and and you know that this is this is where their where their attention's at, you know. And the fact is, most Japanese live in the city, and urban problems are their problems. And and a party that's willing to um, prioritize those issues, um, you know, I, I I mean, there's definitely a place I think in the political system for that. I, I you know I don't think, you know, the Party of Hope is not going to be the vehicle for that. I think I think that we're already seeing uh, the bringing on board a bunch of Democratic. Party members who, when they were in the Democratic Party, refused to accept discipline, that they're not going to be any easier to discipline this time around. Um, but, you know, maybe as it goes through, it kind of, as it matures or as it changes its name or whatever else happens with it, that that uh, potential is there. And as for Ishin, I mean, I think if you look at, I mean, you know, they, they, in the last couple election cycles, they had they did a great job in those single member districts in Osaka. But, you know, they're, they're fighting for life right now. And so you wonder how much longer uh, that's going to be um, a going concern um, as far as, I mean, maybe, you know, they'll hang around as, as an Osaka-only party, but that, that they're nowhere near what they once were. But I still think, um, 
you know the potential for a party that that is strong in Tokyo and in Osaka, Nagoya, you know, that, and speaks to the issues that urban voters care about. That there is, um, you know, that that cleavage has also been exposed. To that, I would simply add that the. Uh, there is a problem with those parties in, in that they, of course, rob uh, any kind of anti-LDP uh, unified opposition of any chance of, of, of getting the votes where they are most uh, prevalent, and which is in uh, in the urban areas. We have we have 51 percent of the of population lives in either Osaka, Nagoya, or Tokyo in, in the immediate area. Uh, that being said. Uh, th uh, the question of the survivability of these the, these parties, including the tax party uh, of, uh, of of Nagoya uh, and Aichi Prefecture, uh, regional identity uh, is great for Osaka and to a certain extent for Nagoya. I don't see it as being a possibility uh, in the capital. Uh, the, the the two other parties are basically resentful, and and they are parties of resentment uh, here in terms of the Hope Party or its, its antecedent, the uh, Tomin First Party, uh, that th the politics of resentment is, for me is, is good for one election. I would like to, to remember that uh, Ishin, uh, when it ran for the first time in 2012, got 12 million votes. In the next election, it got half of that and has now, in terms of uh, uh, the proportional vote will be will be truly struggling to, to reach uh, anything more than two million. Uh, it, it's it's uh, th this idea of a regional con uh, party uh, having long-term survivability uh, to me seems uh, un unlikely and without any uh, real basis. I'm going to Richard now. <clears throat> Richard Lloyd Power of the Times. Since it's a, a casual discussion, I'll refrain from the traditional hostile, aggressive bullying <laughs> question and ask something more chummy instead. Um, and I wanted to ask about, um, uh, about Miss Koike and that, that moment, that week, where she appeared on the face of it to have a tremendous opportunity. I mean, looking back now, it all seems like maybe a bit of a fantasy, but she declared the... Uh, you know, the, the, the foundation of her, her new party. A day or two after that, uh, my Hara brought the DP crashing down on top of him and, and walked out. And so you had this moment where, where you had a, a party that had uh, a strong and popular leadership but no infrastructure, mm. and a party without any leadership but a, a very big and, you know, sound infrastructure, offices in every prefecture and so on. And it seemed then as if there was at least a possibility, if Koike had taken it, to, to bring the two together if she'd been a bit more inclusive uh, and not immediately excluded people on the left of, of the DP. What, was that remotely plausible, do you think? Could, could that ever wor have worked out? And, and could some kind of grand opposition alliance emerge in the future? You want to go for it? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, the, and the reason for that is that the, the DP itself was on an unstable uh, coalition. Uh, the, the, one of the mysteries is, you know, how, how does, first of all, a person like Mai Hara, why is he even in the DP? Uh, and how, does, how do they remain there? And how do they keep getting elected? Uh, and I think that the, the answer lies in the fact that uh, Maihara and other graduates of the Matsushita School of, of Management and Government, the Matsushita Seikejuku, uh, are gear their entire lives to winning district election, district seats. They know how to create the coalition of interests that gets them elected in those seats, and it doesn't matter whether they're LDP or DP. Uh, now, unfortunately, in the Japanese political system, people who win district seats are seen as a better sort of politician than the ones who, who slide in on the proportional vote. Uh, they have more clout within party structures. That's definitely true in the LDP and a certain extent true uh, with what was the DP. And they're seen as more legitimate. But the truth is the, these, uh, particularly the Matsusta Seike people, really are in it only for themselves. And they were and Maihara's behavior once he was elected president of, of and, and the behavior of Gemba, uh, the behavior of Matsubara Jin, who 
quit the DP after leading it in the Tokyo elections to defeat, and then immediately pops up on the rostrum of the Hope Party's launch uh, when he ran against Tomin first. This guy is opportunism exemplified, and he's also Matsushita Seke. Uh, this is the, that was the problem with saving the DP using hope as the way of transferring all these people and their infrastructure into a new, into a, a new direction. They were a, a crappy bunch of folks to have together. <laughs> it, was not a par it was not a fun party. Uh, it's now separated. And the, a lot of folks who are in hope will probably immediately pull the ripcord once, they, once uh, the, the polls close on the 22nd. In my view, they are, there's nothing that holds them in the party of hope since they do not have uh, the captain, that is uh, Ms. Mrs. Koike, there at the top of the party to be the candidate for prime minister. They have no reason to stay. They were, they'll stay in only for so long as to get through this election. That's, he talks about discipline. I, th I, don't, I don't even see unity. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there, whatever becomes of that will be uh, what, you know, I, I don't know. So the hope, um, it never had one and it doesn't have one now. Where will they keep on the tour? Hmm? Where will they keep on the tour people go when they're over uh, where will they go? They will go first as independents uh, in order to have some kind of ethical stance. Mm -hmm. But eventually they will drift, especially as, as the parties need to bulk up their numbers mm -hmm. in, by December the 31st in order to get the, a nice package from the voters mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the political funds that are doled out by the public political funds, you'll see a lot of matchmaking, most likely, uh, in the last days of December, suddenly people finding their true loves. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm being, I'm being flippant. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, I think, you know, I think there are probably people who uh, swallowed their principles to join the Party of Hope, and, you know, maybe, you know, and, and again, because it was this timing issue, um, where you, you know, hope was, was there, was ready, and it you know, looked like it was coming, and then all of a sudden, a week later, you get um, Edano saying, actually, no, you know, I'm gonna take all the, you know, all, all of the people who were left behind, all the orphans, um, and we're gonna have our own party. And oh, now it looks like, now they're up and coming. I mean, that, that, that will probably look attractive to certainly some of the people who are a little more, um, maybe hesitant about the, uh, the conditions that Koike imposed. You know, and I don't, think, I don't think she was wrong to impose those conditions. I mean, whether, I mean, you know, the fact is that the Democratic Party was not, it was not, it was not savable. And the idea, you know, and, and, and you know, I, you know, like, you know, look, whether Maya Hara intended to do this when he ran for the leadership or not, it was probably the right move to pull the plug on it. I mean, I think he could have done it in a less, um, maybe in a, a less underhanded sort of way, but, um, you know, the, you know, Japan is better for, for not having the Democratic Party at this point. I mean, the party it had become, um, it, was ne it was never gonna be saved. You were never gonna convince voters uh, to kind of let go with what happened when they were in power. And you know, now, in, you know, in some ways, you're able to press reset. And, and that, I think, is the, um, you know, perhaps the, the hope going forward for the Constitutional Democrats is that by starting again, that you know, as you approach um, upper house elections in 2019, and also local elections in 2019, um, that you that you start drawing new people in to politics. You know, and that you know, I don't know, has talked and talked about um, you know, bottom up democracy, and you know, and and you know, any um, you know that if you want to talk about kind of what cleavage structures, I mean, that, that given the LDP is now the home for um, hereditary politicians, and that does not seem to be changing. You know, that any opposition party needs to make itself the party of openness and inclusiveness and bringing people who have generally not been involved in politics and not run for office in. Um, and if that is the party's identity going forward, and that's the kind of thing that it becomes, I mean, I think that would be a, a great thing for Japanese democracy and an improvement um, over the Democratic Party, which often just seemed to be a kind of place of refuge for people who were stuck in L, you know, districts where the LDP, you know, the LDP candidate was someone hereditary, and you were never going to get the LDP nomination. So, well, okay, I'll run, you know, from the Democratic Party, you know, because, you know, at least they're willing to give me an endorsement. But, um, you know, you, I mean, I think you know, an opposition party has to be better than that. And, you know, and so in that way, so that you know, we'll see which of the independents survive. We'll see which of the the Party of Hope people survive. But you know, that there might be a house cleaning on the opposition side of of the aisle this time around, and that, 
you know, next, when, next time there's a general election that you might see some newer faces. And I think, I think that would be uh, a positive thing. Okay, thank you. And um, the gentleman there at the back. Hello, Ian also with the French Business Paper Les Echo. Before we go further on ideology, can we talk about the money? <laughs> uh, Edano would like to be Prime Minister on, in the long term, but he had only 78 candidates. Mm. Uh, to what point the Kyoto Kukin system, the deposit system, is really the real issue to this election? Mm. Uh, well, <laughs> so the Kyoto Kukin has always been a favorite of mine. Uh, I am thrilled to pieces that this is the first time that politicians have been complaining about it. Uh, up until now, with the, the very formal party structures and the ways of doing fundraising, uh, most politicians just thought it was the price of doing business. Uh, when Hollower Koike, who has no money, establishes a party, she forces her own uh, candidates to pony up. They suddenly discover that there is this three million yen that you have to pay in order. Gosh, and that's a lot of money, and and and, and this is unfair, and this is how can this even be constitutional? I'm very glad that this discussion has finally started. Uh, this story, it, it, the, the grubby story behind this election, of course, is is how much it costs to run for office here in Japan. You do have to pay the deposit, uh, and if you run only on the proportional list, it's six million. Uh, the uh, question of who pays the office expenses, again, Koike had to ask many of her candidates to pay it out of their own pockets. And what Maihara had when he approached uh, Koike was all of the money that had been provided by the public through, for DP activities. He could dole it out to these new, newly minted Party of Hope candidates to pay for their expenses. That was the sum total of what he could offer. And in return, he was supposed to get the brand. She would provide the brand, he would provide the funds. She didn't show up. The Party of Hope at that point uh, has people who are, are fully funded, but uh, who don't have, uh, as I said, a captain. Now, this uh, question of how much it costs to run, uh, of course, is all the way through Japanese politics. If you run for the village assembly, it's free. Uh, but for every other kind of elected office, governor, mayor, uh, you, have to, you have to pay, and, and that's also uh, for a prefectural assembly, you have to pay a deposit. And it's a sizable amount of money for an, a, a, a person of modest means. Uh, until now, this election, it has not been that much of a discussion, but it, it's a significant issue, and I am glad that, this, uh, that uh, people are asking questions about it. And I think, you know, again, it's, it's you know, any sort of opposition party worthy of the name should make you know, this kind of political reform central to its identity. And that, you know, you hope, again, with a, with a new um, sort of liberal party um, that, you know, making the political system more accessible, making, you know, not you know not you know you know particularly having deposits for for subnational elections and and I mean the, the barriers to entry um, you know an opposition party that's not making an issue of that is doing something wrong and so you hope that the fact that it's now out there it's now something people are thinking about um, you know not that you expect uh, the LDP to to do much with it but at least it should be ta it should be ta talked about beyond the election yeah. and and there is of course the question uh, in terms long terms in terms of the democracy that is here in Japan, of the decay of local elections. Uh, that there is simply uh, too many of, there, too, there are too many of the seats uh, in municipal assemblies, uh, in prefectural assemblies, uh, too many mayor's offices that are being filled by default. Someone, just one person showing up at the, uh, the, the registry, putting their name down, putting down the deposit, and because there are no challengers, immediately uh, become uh, the, uh, the office holder. There's no election. The whole structure at the lower levels of Japanese democracy is coming undone. Uh, there are simply not enough people running. And it's up to the national uh, politicians to revitalize uh, interest in politics and belief in politics. Yeah. But if they indeed create on the national level an image of an LDP that cannot be replaced and there is no hope out there, uh, 
that that filters down to the local level and it erodes the very foundations because it, uh, of Japanese democracy because that's where you you grow and develop the new generation that will replace these legacy candidates. Yeah. But if nobody's running for office in the local areas, uh, where are you going to get your, your seed corn for your field? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, the, the candidates don't come from nowhere. And you look at you know, where LDP candidates are coming from. If they're not hereditary, um, Chances are they've you know they've served several terms in a prefectural assembly and they've they've run for office and you, and you need to get people from somewhere, and I mean that's why you know, hopefully coming out of this election that that the CDP does take the 2019 local elections as seriously as the upper house elections, and you know that the, you know it's it that if it gets enough people energized to actually try to run for office, but I mean there are I mean you know the you know from the deposit to uh, sort of the thankless task of having to govern. Um, when there's no money, I mean, it's not it's not an easy job. But what, what um, he means by that is that if you're going to run a local municipality, yeah. <laughs> if you're mayor of a town that is dependent on the national government to survive, and every year the budget's getting cut, yeah. uh, who wants that job? You know, that, that it, it, there's an attractiveness issue. Yeah, I mean, trying to you know figure out how to you know pairing back services. I mean, it's not it's these are not these are thankless tasks, but. Um, you want to have a democracy. Someone's got to do them, and you know, preferably, you know, it's not just one party that takes all of it by default. It's been handed out most of it already to the Party of Hope candidates. Uh, there is some left, but that involves the House of Councilors members of the of the still extant DP. And uh, you may have noticed that, that House of Councilors members of the DP, uh, they, they campaign for both Kibol uh, Hope candidates and for C CDPJ candidates. They're, they're, that issue of, of money and division and who's with whom uh, will have to be decided after the election. Yeah, and that's one of the things to watch, what happens with, you know, the fact that you had, I mean, I would expect that a good chunk of the Democratic Party members in the upper house would end up in the constitutional Democrats just because they tend to be more to the left of the of the Democratic Party anyway. But you know, how that sorts out, um, you know, where they go and on what terms. I mean, I think there there are a number of questions that uh, will be resolved. I think after the election, and that that's a big one. And by left, he means idealistic. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Old habits die hard. <laughs> okay, so um, Peter, sorry, we you asking a question, and then we'll come over here, and we've got plenty of time to get around. So, hi there, it's Peter Langen at uh, Asia Times. Um, one of the major irritants for Mr. Abe before the election was this questioning of the diet on the so-called cronyism scandal. Uh, assuming he gets back in and Mr. Adano does head the, the largest opposition party, how do you see that resurfacing and do you think it has any traction? Thank you. The problem is time. Right, you know, that right, so elections will be over. Abe, you know, they'll have a, a special section, session to re-elect Abe as prime minister and you've got a new cabinet. You know, and then, then we're looking at a couple more months until you really have um, you know, the opportunity to have diet proceedings where the questions are going to come up. And I mean, how long can you sustain interest in this? I mean, the pu I mean, not that the public is over it, but they just, they, like, a lot of the anger seems to have dissipated over time. And then it just, it's not, you know, that without new revelations after a certain point, that just, it's, it's hard to, to sustain the media's interest, it's hard to sustain the public's interest. And that it just now it's just kind of part of the furniture. Like, yeah, Abe did some favors for some, you know, for his friends. We don't like it. Um, it's, I think, to some extent, reflected in the fact that his approval ratings have started to dip down. I mean, it has been talked about in the campaign. I'm sure people are remembering. Hey, yeah, I didn't like that. But um, you know, it's it, it was you know they're kind of weird scandals in that there was nothing. It was, you know, there was never anything clear enough that said you know Abe did X, Y, and Z, and therefore. Yeah, there's a there's a case for him to go, um, but there was always enough to keep people talking about it. But it just at some point, this is just, you know, it's going to be noise. But there's not there's just not, um, you know, it's just it's running out of steam already. And I think by January, are people still going to really be talking about it? I, I don't know. I don't know if you've. Well, the thing is, is that the the whole cast of characters will be really elected to the diet. Uh, Hagiuda, who made the uh, visit to the ministry to force the issue on the Kakegakuen scandal. He's going to be re-elected from his district, 
both the Kibola ta candidate and the uh, uh, the CDBJ candidate will knock each other out. Uh, uh, Shimomura, who is in, with the uh, Ministry of Education Asen scandal, he'll be returned to office. Uh, nobody that has been associated with the uh, any of these scandals uh, is going to be kicked out. So for any opposition party coming in, the same cast of villains will be available to them <laughs> to, to draw and drag into in, 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 budget, in bu budget committee session, because you can ask any questions you want in budget committee session. So I, I don't see it, I mean, it might die down in terms of the public's view, but it will still be put into by, diet mm. budget committee discussions, mm -hmm. and that Mr. Abe has merely just delayed. It was going to be rediscussed yeah. in a fall extraordinary session. That session was so short circuited by the by the dissolution of the diet. But when they come back, hmm. that's what they can they can talk about, and they will talk about it. And Mr. Abe has to be careful about that. Yeah. Uh, he has to be worried because scandal has brought him down in the past. We, I don't think he can be too sanguinary and too, too, too happy with himself, uh, especially when you think about the number of people who will actually be voting uh, for the LDP in this election. There are about 106 million voters. He will get somewhere between 17 and 18 million. That's you know, 17 or 18 percent, or less, less than 17 percent of the people voted for him and his party. That's not much of a mandate, and that's not a place where you can stand with a great deal of self-confidence. So I, he, he needs to be careful. I mean, and I, you know, and I will say that we could still be in a situation where he can win you know, an overwhelming number of seats in the diet and still come out of the election and still have his approval ratings falling. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we'll see what, you know, you know, what changes to the cabinet are made after the election. I mean, that, that remains to be seen. Um, but given that over the course of the campaign, he is, he is, his, pop, his unpopularity is growing again. And so it's going to be an interesting situation if we come out of this election and on election night, everyone is celebrating you know, how, you know, what a smashing victory Abe has won again. He has led us to, to, to victory. He's smashed the Democrats um, into pieces. And, and yet, you can come out of this and maybe he gets a, a temporary bump from it and next month his approval ratings are falling again. Um, and, and, then, and then what does the LDP do? That on the one hand, how, you know, how do you deny a leader who has led you now to uh, five straight national election victories, if you count the upper house as well, um, how do you deny him a third term? But on the other hand, um, you know, if, you know, whether because of the scandal or people don't like him talking about the Constitution or, you know, take your pick of issues or they don't like his relationship with, with President Trump or, I mean, you know, there are any number of reasons. Um, what is the LDP going to do then? You know, that it's going to go into this, this leadership election next year, kind of having to give Abe another term, but on the other hand, not necessarily feel, you know, being too happy with how the public sees him. Yeah, and the, and the LDP and Abe can win big on Sunday and still lose. Yeah. This, if the combined proportional vote for Hope and the CDPJ is higher than the total for the LDP, this will be a replay of what happened with the New Frontier Party back in the 90s when they humiliated uh, the, the LDP prime minister by winning more votes in the proportional vote which is the popularity contest. At that point, you can have a situation where Abe can be, have two-thirds majorities and in both houses and be seen as un, uh, unpopular and unstable. It's, it's, an, it's the gearing of the electoral system, the first pass to the post system, can lead to a very numerically strong prime minister who still is very cautious and very careful and doesn't do a lot of the reforms that he promised or any of the reforms that the world's markets expect, mm. that he just incrementally moves along because he knows fundamentally, especially if the, the outcome that I just described takes place, that he's not the people's mm. choice. Mm. Okay, we'll do a little sweep across here, so we'll come to you and then come over to yourself. Hi, Sophie Jackman from Kyoto News English. 
Thank you for coming. I was just about to ask you about the leadership election, actually, because you hinted at what this election will mean for Prime Minister Abe. What, I mean, what kind of signs would we see that they might be going to ditch him? And what signs might we see that they might re-elect him? And then on, separately from the Mori, Moritomo and Kake thing, how might the outcome change what kind of policies he's able to get through in that time, uh, constitutional amendment and otherwise? Thanks. Mm -hmm. first, I'll take the latter part of that question. Uh, I don't think that the election outcome will change the constitutional amendment issue at all because the constitutional amendment issue is not the number of seats in the House of Counselors and the House of Representatives. The, how, the constitutional issue is whether Mr. Abe can convince 51% of the voters or 50% of the voters plus one to vote for in a referendum for his idea. I do not believe he can do that. He has the reverse of the Koizumi magic. Koizumi, Junichiro, when he would start talking about something, he would have maybe a third of the people on his side. But after f six weeks, two thirds of the people would be for the idea and they say, it's great, let's go with it. Abe is the exact opposite. The longer he <laughs> talks about something, the fewer people like it. And that kills a, the referendum step. So he can get the House of Reps, he can get the House of Counselors, but he still has to deal with the damn people. And they just don't follow what he says. I mean, I think you could just hold an election for a different people. I mean, that's, that yeah. might be his best option at this point. Um, and then there's also the question of, the, I, mean, I mean, the amendments on offer. I mean, now the LDP has run on um, three amendments that are, I mean, we were talking about this, just patently absurd. I mean, um, I mean the constitutional status of, of the self-defense forces. I mean, I mean, maybe you can convince a majority just because people actually kind of like the self-defense forces as they are. And, but I mean, it is an amendment that legitimizes the status quo. Um, and as I'm, you know, I'm not going to take credit for this. This is this is Michael's point that just yeah, you're admitting the communists have been right all along. That if you have to put if you have to make it explicit, then then that means that they haven't been constitutional all these years. So it's I mean, I mean that that has its issues. Um, the the school funding. I mean that it's I guess popular, but do you need a constitutional amendment for it? And then um, the latest edition of of uh, making it unconstitutional to combine um, prefectures into, into districts. Again, this was something the LDP did a couple of years ago. And so then you, why can't you just change it by law? Why do you need it? I mean, it's just there are these, the whole agenda they've laid out um, just seems kind of absurd. So then the question is, you can really waste time on this. Or you can convince Komoito to waste time. And you know, it's like even before the election, there's still a question of, okay, so you have the numbers, but do you have the numbers that you can actually get enough people to agree on everything and you know, agree on, on which amendments uh, are worth doing and um, uh, getting everyone to agree on the, you know, the same changes. I mean, it's, it's, you know, none of this is going to happen quickly. Um, none of this is guaranteed to happen. And who knows what the voters are going to think at the end of it. So I mean, it, this does not materially change how things stand in terms of the constitutional revision. Um, as far as the LDP leadership election is concerned, I mean, the thing, the thing about, I mean, even if Abe's approval numbers start falling again, um, I mean, he has shown a, a certain degree of resilience and, you know, he has bounced back up, so it's always possible that even if he falls, I mean, things would have to, I mean, if he falls below 30 and stays there and there's no real sign of, of recovery, I mean, I have to imagine that the, the discussion heading into the leadership election has to change, you know, election victory notwithstanding, that at some point, you know, do they really want to be stuck with a prime minister who's, you know, you know, if the public, if he's lost the public, are they going to really give him another three years? I mean, it's a real question. Um, but it might, we might not really know, I think, until, you know, at least the spring of next year, if not later. I mean, I think, you know, see how things are coming out of the election, what sort of balance he does get, if, you know, if any. Anything. Yeah, the leadership election should be an automatic for him. You've led, you've led us to victory over and over again. We don't change horses in midstream, all those wonderful uh, nostrums. Uh, I, I don't see that, ba based on the, the conservative respect for seniority, respect for uh, the, the power of elections, I don't see there being an, a necessary avenue for someone to challenge him. 
even I, I, I take issue. I don't think that the, the, necess the question of personal popularity enters into it. Uh, the question is what happens to the people who have been playing on that <laughs> issue within the LDP post-election? People like Ishiba Shigeru, who has been playing fast and loose with his, his loyalty, mm. if, or, so, or whatever it is that it, he, he may be exhibiting right now. Uh, those folks, how will they be interacting, if at all, mm. uh, with uh, Abe? W clearly, he'll be fro he and his faction will be frozen out of all cabinet positions, no question about that. Yeah. Uh, but beyond that, uh, will, will Noda Seiko be reappointed to the cabinet now that, that she's no longer useful in terms of showing how open-minded Mr. Abe can be? <laughs> uh, the, 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 uh, the, the cabinet selections will be, yeah. tell us a lot about his survivability. That, so that's one thing to look forward to. Yeah. Okay. And this gentleman here, then yourself, Alistair. Here he is. Middle Smith, uh, CLSA. I'll go back to being the evil uh, financier and ask the, uh, <laughs> the money numbers. My recollection was that the uh, DPJ had 11.8 .8 billion yen. Uh, wasn't that the number? So they handed out to um, candidates 12 million yen. Mm -hmm. So 11.8 .8 billion divided by 12 is 983. Three, which suggests that they haven't actually paid out um, most of the money in the uh, the DPJ coffers. In which case, it's up for a um, a legal battle because the party had been uh, dissolved. I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts on what happens about that legal battle for the uh, the ownership of the money. And secondly, um, looking at the the other financing for uh, for what had been the opposition, the DPJ, it had been from the unions. Yeah. Um, and obviously um, this is a battle between the right and the far right where um, Koike is the far right so she's the one that wants to change the constitution every bit as much as him my guess is that the uh, unions are not going to want, particularly public service unions are not going to want to support the, uh, the DPJ so I'm just interested in the uh, political financing going forward <laughs> My understanding is that the uh, candidates received not, not uh, 12 million, but, but 20. But we'll work out the numbers in terms of that. Uh, in terms of the labor unions, uh, as you've seen, Rengo doesn't know what to do. Yeah. It is completely uh, a prisoner, again, of that framework of left versus right. Mm. Uh, and that makes sense, because if you think of, of, of the, the traditional it's, it's management versus labor, uh, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, with the split that has gone between the CDPJ and with the Hope Party, they don't know where their support should go, and it's, they've basically said it's, it's, up, it's up, to, uh, local individual, up to the individuals and local chapters. Uh, that is a major change, the, the, um, a major structural change, and there's no question about that. What is going to happen in terms of House of Councilors seats, particularly the proportional lists mm. where the labor unions provided most of the candidates for the DP, uh, and they would be the ones that would be elected off the proportional list given that system. Uh, that clearly cannot go on. or They have to choose which party to support yeah. if they want to still have some uh, say. Now, that being said, unions in, in Japan, even public service unions, have always had this uh, blended identity where they don't really represent the workers. They also, to a certain extent, represent management. That's what happens in a corporatist system. You want to buy in to what people are doing because you want to be there at the table the next day and the next day and the next day. So you learn to get along, and that's what Rengo has done. Uh, this election has finally forced them uh, out of their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. you, you know, are you, are, are you with workers or are you with management? And they've, they've, they've really freaked out about that. I mean, I think there's also, I mean, to continue with the theme, there's an idealist, pragmatist division within, um, within Rengo itself. And we've seen this because we've seen how Abe has courted Rengo aggressively and, you know, tr seek to enlist it as an ally in it, in, you know, in his own struggles against, um, against corporate Japan. Um, and you, several months before the elections, you had, um, you know, you had uh, uh, 
Mr. Closer, the uh, the chairman of Rango, sitting down with Abe and saying, "I agree to, to back your your work reform legislation." And then, you know, days later, say his his membership saying, "No, we don't. We don't support that at all. You have to back out." And he backs out of that. Um, and so, you already had a um, you know kind of a cleavage within Rango, you know, on this idealist pragmatist line. And now you have the split of the Democratic Party almost forcing the issue wide open. Um, and it's really, I mean, I mean, I certainly have to wonder how long Rango could stay together. I mean, obviously it formed as a, a you know, as a federation of kind of left and centrist unions that had their own party affiliations in the past. And you wonder that, okay, that now as, um, you know, the opposition party that emerged out of that process is no more, um, you know, can Rango itself hold together, you know, as a, you know, and certainly when it comes to, to acting as a political um, force or, you know, you know are you going to have some who split off and, um, you know, and go the, with the Constitutional Democrats and some who stay with the Party of Hope or whatever comes after the Party of Hope? Um, you know, do you have kind of a, a pragmatist wing that um, is willing to be uh, closer to Abe and with the LDP and, you know, appreciating the, the wage, um, you know, his wage and incomes policy? I mean, that, I think, is, is a question going forward. I mean, they're going to be pulled um, in lots of different directions, and it's really hard to see the organization that went into this election um, emerging in the same form. In addition, and in terms of, of the Party of Hope, while I, I dump on it a great deal, uh, at least they brought up the question of taxing uh, earnings, uh, of taxing uh, retained earnings that, have, uh, that are otherwise being banked. Uh, that concept, of course, has been kicked around for a long time. Uh, the LDP immediately said, if, if you start doing that, companies will leave Japan. Uh, okay, maybe. We'll, we'll see if that works. Uh, I can tell you that the Caribbean is not a place to relocate right now. <laughs> uh, but uh, th the idea that there are two deals that have to be struck. The first is there has to be labor flexibility. The, the, the perversion of Japanese politics and economics is that you cannot move a, a highly uh, obedient, educated, intelligent, uh, hardworking group of folks. You cannot take that, which is the Japanese labor force, and make a, 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 str a strong economy. You cannot do that. Well, yeah, if they get stuck in jobs that don't use them effectively. They get stuck because of the guarantees of permanent employment that keep them in places where their talents are not used productively. So we need labor reform. That's, everybody knows that. But how do you get to that? Yeah. Rengo has been a problem with that. Yeah. You know, they don't want the permanent employee's special status to be touched in any way. Right. Uh, and the same is true with the white collar corporate management workers. They definitely don't want to have the salary man's special permanent world in any way touched. So who, you know, who is going to be the vanguard for the workers in that regard? Yeah. Uh, that's one. The second, of course, is the one that, and, and this, the Abe administration s was screaming internally about this, was retained earnings. Mm -hmm. That the corporate sector, after the devaluation, oh, I'm sorry, monetary easing, uh, that <laughs> took place, uh, took that money that they got as a special bonus from the devaluation and put it in the bank, where it was supposed to go to shareholders, as dividends or to w increased wages or new investment. They sat on it. Well, that, those are, two, those are two, the two big issues. And Hope brought up at least the aspect of mm. what do we do about earnings. Mm. I mean, and I think, um, yeah, and then you wonder, you know, wh because, you know, where labor goes does depend, you know, does, will influence, I think, what this debate looks like going forward. Because, I mean, if, you're, if we're talking about labor flexibility, then there are two, basically two different directions you can go. That you can go you know, sort of in the Anglo-Saxon direction, and it's just sort of like you're out, you're out on your own in the workforce, and you can be cut loose, and you know, it's up to you to, um, you know, if you need to reskill, well, good luck, and um, you, know, you, you sort of survive by your wits. Um, you know, or it's a more you know, continental European, Scandinavian, where you know, the whole point is, you know, we want to encourage you to switch jobs, you know, so that there's not going to be, um, you're not going to have job security, but you'll have, um, you know, a safety net underneath you to, you know, if you need new skills, we'll support you in doing that. And the LDP is, you know, Abe, to his credit, has, I mean, I think he's talked about this for a long time. You know, when he was first prime minister, it was always, it was about side chat and, you know, that we're going to at least talk about trying to figure out how to um, help people, um, 
move between jobs. But then again, Abe's kind of talked about everything at one point or time or another. And so you've had, um, you know, so sometimes it's about the kind of things that, you know, would, would help people um, change jobs flexibly and, and you know, have some sort of safety net that enables them to take the risk that come with switching jobs or starting a business. Um, but other times it seems to be as much about let's protect permanent employees and actually help people, um, you know, it's almost like let's encourage people to make the leap from non-regular employment to regular employment and you still have this special category of protected worker. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's how do you get through that transition period that I think no one's really figured out? That, you know, how do you, um, you know, and, and frankly, it, it, the other thing that I think we've seen um, from this whole process is also Japan has no neoliberal party in any serious way. You know, that there is not a party out there, you know, that there, there have been points in time where you could say maybe Koizumi, you know, was, was kind of a neoliberal in, in a North American or European sense, or, um, you know, your party during its brief life, you know, trended that way. But the party of hope is not. You know, the LDP is not, the constitutional Democrats are not, there's not a party that is calling for, you know, that is a strict, you know, we are going to deregulate and privatize and, you know, move in an Anglo-Saxon direction. You know, I think that whatever portion of the Japanese political system was in that camp, you know, 15 or 20 years ago is not, and the voters do not want it. And so, um, you know, in theory, there's a consensus that if you were going to have reform, it's going to be in a... Um, you know, having a safety net for individuals instead of for companies and unions and regular workers. Um, but there is the question of how you're going to pay for it, what exactly is it going to look look like, and, um, you know, what does the transition period look like? And I don't know if anyone really has an answer to that. I would only say that uh, Edano Yukio uh, has in his own family history, uh, his father was a salaryman who worked for a company that went bankrupt. Uh, so in terms of if you believe that leaders and their psychology uh, can affect outcomes in a significant way in, polit in, in the political world, you might want to look into his personal background to see where at least the CDPJ might be headed. Hmm. Alistair. Um, Alastair Gale from the Wall Street Journal. Thank you for doing this. Um, just going back to uh, what Professor Kuche was saying at the beginning, this uh, pragmatist idealist divide is this is this something that is a function of the debate over constitutional reform and is it just the case that the idealists have something to be idealistic about mm. um, or is it a cleavage that you think will uh, continue in Japanese politics and what are the issues that uh, the idealists uh, would look to um, you know to support their their you know, way of doing politics, thank you. Well, they have an immediate program, and it's one that is shared with the communists, which is the immediate uh, rescinding of the collective security uh, legislation, the uh, Special Designated Secrets Act, and the uh, Conspiracy Act. Those three are seen by both the, the formal communist party that, that has its own issues, but by this new idealist party, uh, as fundamental, that these were the uh, examples of pragmatism run amok. And run amok is what, that, that's the Communist Party's, the <laughs> Bosso, State, uh, Abe Seiken. Uh, they, that's the term that they use, out of, out of control. What they mean is actually not really out of control, it's cutting corners. Hmm. Abe has cut corners in order to deliver on pragmatic goals, legacy goals to be sure, of uh, people who are interested in securing Japan. But he, he got there through some twisted, uh, t through some, some maneuvering that looked ugly. The problem with, for example, the collective security uh, legislation was not that uh, it created a, a, a uh, uh, an ability for Japan to get involved in war. That's the Communist Party line. The, 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 part, the part that created the Shields movement, the Shields movement in, in, in here of, of young people getting involved, that was on the idealistic basis that you don't mess with the Cabinet Legislative Bureau. You don't put, you don't go against 40 years or 50 years of precedent and put in your own person just for the simple act of passing a certain piece of legislation that heretofore the CLB has always declared unconstitutional. That he did this end around, which is entirely, with, was always something a prime minister could do. 
There is no reason, this, the CLB has no constitutional standing at all, but the, the, the procedures that had grown up over the post-war era said that the CLB, which gave, which it, if you're not familiar with, with what, because they, they, they don't even have a press office, <laughs> uh, the CLB determines the constitutionally or unconstitutionality of every act of the government before it's put before the cabinet. Uh, that you don't need a Supreme Court because the CLB has already checked it. Uh, I, I, that's what has happened. Mr. Abe went outside of their normal hierarchy, put in his own man, who then said, look, collective security. It was, it was unconstitutional, but it turns out all of my predecessors were wrong. <laughs> uh, that, he, that, was, that he did that, that was what was offensive. And that's what got people upset. And it's the cutting of corners, the pragmatism. I mean, the eventual outcome was pretty poor, too. Yeah. <laughs> Have we where are these, these uh, marauding bands of SDF going around the world, getting involved in all the world's wars? It's the exact opposite. Japan's forces withdrew from South Sudan. They're not involved in collective security anywhere. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the issue is really the idealist view that we, we need to do things according to the book, according to the law, according to the Constitution, and not, take, and not cut corners. Why? Because when you do it by cutting corners, you don't have the people's approval. And that's the source of the legitimacy that makes future actions, makes reforms meaningful. I mean, and that's, you know, the, the, you know, the Japanese Communist Party is you know, in, in a large sense, it's a small C conservative party. I mean, and it is, you know, in favor of, um, you know, kind of think, you know, you know, that it's, you know, the traditional economic model, the constitution as it stands. But also, you know, that, that a lot of this is about norms and parliamentary norms and how, the, you know, how the diet has functioned, which, is, which has been um, not Westminster, right? That, you know, the opposition has, um, you know, is you know essentially consulted behind the scenes and does you know does have its opportunity and that it you know that you don't you know that the you know this is, every time this happens that it's always about ramming legislation through and you know that essentially you know the LDP um, under Abe and the opposition are essentially in different mental universes where you know uh, Abe is essentially I'm a Westminster Prime Minister I have a majority I have the numbers I can do whatever I want and you know I don't have to listen to you and I don't have to you know I don't need your buy-in because you don't have the numbers and I have the votes. And, uh, oh, but, but he has been very slow in taking yeah. advantage of it. And in fact, in terms of the two-thirds majorities that he got in the 216 election, he, he hasn't done constitutional yeah. revision with it. Yeah. And in, in terms of the collective security legislation, it was uh, July of, of 2015, and, and then the decision came a, a year and, and six months was, later. Yeah, it was 14, and then, well, 14, and, and, sorry, I mean, yeah. and the norms are sticky. I mean, that's, you know, that he had, it's not like he can just sweep them aside. And the fact is that you know, think about that diet session that led to those laws being passed. I mean, he extended it how many months, you know, and, and let debate, Let them talk. Yeah, let them talk. Oh, you know, so, so it's, not that, it's not that the norms are gone, um, but he has been comfortable, I think, straining at them and pushing at them. And, you know, and then you almost wonder, um, you know, if, you know, as, because right now, I mean, it's hard to know what the CDP stands for. I mean, they haven't really had enough time to figure out um, its particulars. You know, the, do they become a party that wants to roll back the, the kind of centralized executive that we've seen. You know, that, you know, do they say, um, you know, this, this is not who Japan should be, you know, that this has led to, a, you know, the, the, the transgression of norms, that it's led to um, a government kind of doing whatever it wants without getting proper buy-in, and that you know, we are going to scale back um, some of the uh, centralization of power in the Kante um, I mean, it happened. You know, it started before Abe, and you know, the DPJ when they were elected in 2009, they wanted to do much of this as well. And in some ways, Abe has just um, been a more effective implementer of many of the things that the DPJ said it wanted to do in 2009 anyway. Um, but you wonder that again, keeping with this with this kind of approach, you know, bottom up politics and, and um, you know this idealistic um, opposition to. Um, the security state that Abe has been determined to create, that, you know, do they, do they actually seek to roll back the executive um, in broader, you know, I mean, is that even, you know, is that even a realistic program? I don't know, but I mean, it, it would be consistent, I think, with the kind of um, thinking that we've seen. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, please, Seifert.
Siegfried Niedl, <coughs> freelancer from Germany. Um, two questions. One for Michael um, about the uh, idea or the, about the, the indifference of the uh, um, uh, about the, uh, the conservative parties following a kind of a social democratic policy. But is there not a difference between Mrs. Koike and Mr. And, uh, Mr. Abe? Is not um, a Koike following a kind of a neoliberal economic thinking in the, in the footstep of uh, Mr. Koizumi, if she wants to uh, finish a quantitative, a quantitative easing and this kind of policy? And um, this is one, one point. The, my, my second question is, why is, um, did uh, the, um, uh, Kipo Noto fall down in the polls? Um, was it because uh, Mr. Ko uh, Mrs. Koike didn't want some member of the DPJ in the, in the, in the Kipi Noto? Or is it because she didn't run as a candidate for the, for the, for the, uh, for the, uh, uh, for the parliament? Uh? Uh, I, seem, I would agree with the assessment that um, Koike san is more interested in a neoliberal program only because of the way she has approached governance in terms of, of the, the Tokyo Metropolitan District, where she has talked about uh, cutting out uh, old style deals. And old style deals are just ways that money gets spread around. Uh, it, it, I don't uh, think that they are necessarily a bad part of democratic politics, but for her, they were wrong. And that kind of attitude is a neoliberal attitude, that we can clean up the swamp, uh, that we can uh, cut out the self-dealing. Uh, that's, that's part of the neoliberal, so I, I, I do agree, the neoliberal program. Uh, in terms of what was the significant uh, item we will be speaking entirely out of speculation uh, because no public opinion polls have been run. There's no data. Uh, we would be just working impressionistically. Working impressionistically, uh, my sense is, is that's the <laughs> latter one. You cannot have a parliamentary party which does not have a leader that can be elected prime minister. Uh, you just cannot, you, you, on the first day of the extra session, a new, it, there will be a, a, a prime minister's election. And when that happens, the LDP will vote for Mr. Abe, uh, the Komeito will vote for Mr. Yamaguchi, presumably the CDPJ will be, vote for Mr. Adano, but who will the hope vote people vote for? Who, there's no identified person. That was supposed to be Koike's role. You're, that was the brand, that was the party. Uh, but we, they don't have that. And when it became clear that she was no longer, she, she, she has had a reputation of setting the agenda. She certainly did so in her run for the governor. But here the agenda was set by others for her. When uh, Koizumi Shinjiro famously said she suffers from a dilemma of irresponsibility, where he set that up for her. He set her in a place where she could not move because if she quit the governorship, that's irresponsible. If she do, isn't her party's leader, that's irresponsible. She was put in a box by someone else. And losing the momentum, losing the, the initiative was uh, what I think is the major cause, impressionistically speaking, of uh, the demise of the, the Hope Party. I mean, and as far as, as, far as the handling of the, the merger or takeover or whatever you want to call the relationship with the former Democratic Party um, is, I don't know, I mean, I mean to, to the extent that opinion polls have asked about this, the public was not necessarily opposed to how she handled that, you know, and, and you, know, off, you know, imposing conditions on who would come in. Um, so I don't necessarily think it's that, but, I, but the fact um, that it has been so easy for Abe to run around and say, this is just, you know, this is just the same party, they just changed their name for the sake of an election, but, you know, this is, you know, this is, this is a stale product under a new name, and that's easy, you know, the fact that the party is announced on Monday, and by the end of the week, you know, Maya Hara said, we're joining, and all these, you know, you know it becomes a, a party that's gonna run a, a roster of Democratic Party candidates who, you know, the public wasn't exactly thrilled about beforehand. Um, I don't think that helped. So not only did you have no real brand at the top, 
but then you had to take on the ba all the baggage that came from bringing on a bunch of Democratic Party candidates. Um, that didn't do any favors, I think. And so, um, I mean, I, I think you know, that didn't help. To the, to the neoliberal point, um, I mean, I think, I mean, I don't know if that, you know, the kind of cleaning up, if that's either neoliberal or neoliberal populist, which I guess in Japan is what you get, that, you know, it is sort of a, um, you know, you know, you name your enemies and that's, you know, the bureaucrats and it's the entrenched interests and, and, and that's fine for all, um, you know, for what it is. But it, I mean, when you look at that manifesto and I mean, it, it's detailed in a lot of ways. I mean, it, it has almost verbatim, it's very similar to the LDP manifesto. It's very similar to things that the Abe government has already said um, and things that are not terribly neoliberal. You know, the, the special economic zones, there's a lot of industrial policy there. There's a lot of you know, roles for, for the state guiding economic development and promoting in innovation. That doesn't look like neoliberalism to me. And I think even the, the approach to quantitative easing when you actually look at the text, it's very squishy. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's well, we're going to keep things for the time being, but, you know, the end's going to have to come at some point. I don't, is anyone really going to disagree with that? I mean, I think, you know, at some point, you know, there's going to be an exit. I mean, I think, uh, you know, but not, you know, it'd be one thing if they said, well, next year, you know, we're going to have to start winding things down. I mean, they, they left the door pretty wide open for things continuing. Um, and, you know, without really saying, um, you know, how they would approach the replacement of Mr. Kuroda next year. I mean, so, I mean, I think the differences were a lot less uh, maybe than met the eye. I mean, maybe a couple of issues, uh, you know, her willingness to talk about uh, universal basic income is at least interesting. And I think, you know, now you've had a party put that out there and maybe now that picks up more momentum. Um, you know, I think she took some issues from the communist, which, you know, for, for a part, you know, talking about um, Black Kigyo, I mean, these, you know, they, she, she was, um, not unlike Abe, willing to borrow, I think, liberally, you know, across the spectrum when it came to economic policy ideas. And so, you know, I, I, I don't think she really fits neatly in a, you know, this is Koizumiism brought, you know, into a new decade. I mean, I, th I think it's something different. Okay, this gentleman in this gray sweater. Lars Nikolai's in German Press Agency, DPA. Um, I would like, uh, like to come back to the uh, constitution issue. Um, well, assuming that um, Abe will win um, a two-third majority or re uh, retain a uh, two-third majority, he still needs a referendum, and you were not so optimistic that you will win the uh, referendum, right? Um, on the other hand, um, wasn't it amazing how quickly he uh, could improve his uh, support rate in the polls? Um, you gave credit to the uh, cabinet reshuffle, but you never mentioned about uh, North Korea. Um, it, at least at the time when North Korea you know, launched its missiles, um, the support rate went up. So some argue that this also helped him to improve his support rate, right? Um, um, and also all the, the media hype about that. And uh, so how how is the public thinking and how likely is it that the referendum will will be a big failure or uh, maybe he can win the uh, referendum i mean a referendum means uh, for instance, or can mean brexit something like this right so uh, abe is certainly uh, trying to make sure that he will win the referendum by for instance using uh, using the power over the media um, how likely do you think um, it is that he can, uh, by using the North Korean threat and, and issues like that, in order to make sure that he will win the referendum. And uh, how is the, um, from looking f you know, from outside, I mean, uh, we, we see a government winning an election, but at the same time, the public is not really in favor of this uh, government. How do you explain that? I mean, what, what do the Japanese want? I mean, if, if, if this government is, is winning an election, uh, but the public is not, not, not really in favor of this government. A lot, a lot of issues there, too. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so so on, the, on, the last, on the last issue, so, I mean, I, you know, like I said at the very beginning, you know, it's, it's a victory by default, and that is that, um, I mean, and think about it this way. It took the, the Japanese voters a decade from basically from the creation of the Democratic Party of Japan until the Democratic Party of Japan finally was able to win a general election, um, for the voters to say, okay, fine, we'll trust them with power. And, but think about what it took 
to get to that point, that you had to have kind of the disappointments that came after Koizumi left office, and you had you know, Abe and then Fukuda and then Aso, you had this kind of revolving door. Um, you had the global financial crisis, <laughs> and, you, and you had the Democratic Party of Japan under the leadership, you know, sort of Aso, or uh, sorry, uh, Ozawa with the whip hand, and sort of shaping them into a force that could you know, contest an election against the LDP in a lot of different places. Um, so a lot of things had to kind of go their way, and it took a decade. Um, so now we're, we're almost back at square one now, and you know, where you have new parties that are you know, now trying to um, get, you know, find their footing, figure out what they stand for, and then start that long process of convincing voters that they can be trusted with power. So you know, we might, I mean, this could conceivably be another decade you know, it's not impossible that we're going to, you know, that, um, that maybe in a decade we'll see another party that's capable of forming a government. And in the meantime, you know, I think voters are going to, you know, they'll stay home or they'll cast protest votes in upper house elections. And, um, but, you know, in a, you know, in a general election that, you know, if they're given a choice between, um, you know, an, un, you know, an LDP that's kind of unloved, but, um, you know, gets the job done in some capacity versus parties they're not quite ready to trust with power. Um, you know, people are going to stay home or they're going to, you know, vote one way in PR or one, one way in the districts and that you're just not going to get um, kind of the material for, you know, a, a change of government. And I mean, I think, I mean, just that's, that's just the, the mix of ingredients we're looking at now, I think, for the next um, several years. Um, but I just, that, that's just setting aside that. We can kind of circle back to some of the other parts of the question. I don't know if you want to. In terms of the attractiveness or usefulness of the DPRK issue, I think it's a complete wash. Um, Mr. Abe and the LDP have tried to use the word Mamoru, uh, protect, uh, and uh, say Kita Chosen, Kita Chosen, Kita Chosen, every other word. Uh, I haven't heard that quite so much from uh, them this week. Last week, certainly. Uh, I think that the, 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 you have a, a, a significant problem in that in using that issue as a way of driving people to support you. Uh, should we be tough on the DPRK? Yes, uh, as long as we have our big, our big brother, the United States, uh, with holding at our back with its nuclear weapons. Uh, is the way you get the United States on your side by golfing with Donald Trump? I don't think a lot of Japanese think that's great. They don't, I don't think that, that that has legs. So yes, the DPRK issue has some attractiveness, the fear aspect, mm. but the chumminess with the Trump administration is a net negative. Uh, and while it's, it's not something that Mr. Abe can really choose to do, the United, Japan's security depends upon the United States. And Mr. Trump is in charge of the United States ostensibly. Uh, that. Uh, however, the, the views here are very similar to the views of Western Europe in terms of Donald Trump's suitability uh, for the presidency. Uh, it's not a way of increasing your personal pop popularity. It's just seen as something that is contingent upon the situation. I mean, and I would, you know, I, I think there's there's an open question over you know, how much of a role it played in Abe's. Um, Appro you know, approval ratings you know, bouncing back up in August. So I think you know, the reshuffle is definitely a big part of that. Um, you know, I think, uh, and, and, you know, and, and it's also worth noting that that bounce back was not Abe personally, which is, which is why I think there's a strong case to make that it had more to do with you know, him making some wise choices for his cabinet. Because, and that the polls are, the, the question is, do you support the cabinet? Um, so it's always, care it's always, um, you always have to be careful about that because the kind of data points that are in polls that might speak to what the public actually thinks about the prime minister were actually still pretty negative even as his approval ratings were going back up. So for example, among the, you know, and also, and, and you look at um, net approval ratings, I mean, they were still in the low single digits positive by the time you called an election. So this is not back anywhere near to the levels he was at um, earlier this year. And even when he was in the high levels, we must remember he is the first prime minister for whom the category, why do you support the prime minister? Because we don't see anybody else, is the number, number one, one reason. So that was the number one reason. And then the number one reason for disapproval since about May of this year, 
but overwhelmingly, like 50% of people when asked why you don't support the cabinet, because Abe is the prime minister or cannot trust the prime minister, or, you know, it's phrased differently in each polls. And that remained the case even as the numbers were going back up. These were also the same polls that were showing, should Abe be given a third term? Majority said, you know, majority, majority or plurality saying no. So his personal approval ratings were not going back up, I think, by any, you know, I think people did not forget entirely about Moritomo and, and Kakigaku. And, I we'll mean, see a lot of that picture with the wine glasses again <laughs> after all this is over. We'll see that picture of him with the Kakigaku and head with, with that smug, I got mine face on. Because he will have gotten his. And it'll be, it'll, that, that process will, st will continue. Yeah, I mean, people, I mean, I, and I don't think people, um, you know, maybe the, the feelings aren't as raw as they were earlier this year when there was lots of discussion and you actually had revelations. But I mean, the feelings are still there. And just that uh, uh, he is not loved. You know, I, I don't think you can say that, that the Japanese public loves him. I mean, I think they see him as, you know, you know maybe there's, there's a certain amount of, um, you know, uh, an appreciation for certain aspects of things he's done. Um, you know, I think it is interesting that he's polled as well among young Japanese as he has, but then again, um, maybe employment numbers help with that. But um, he is always, I, th I, I mean, I think you know, this election is going to confirm that he's going to have a diff difficult relationship with the Japanese people always. Okay, we've got about uh, 10 minutes to go now, and maybe made these the last two questions. So Richard, then Martin for the closing pitch. Thanks. There's a, something of an air of unreality about the North Korea threat, but it's probably true to say that, that there's a greater chance than there has been for a long time that, that Tokyo could be hit by a nuclear bomb at some point in the next few months. It's all, I mean, it's theoretically, it's almost like a Cold War situation. Mm. Do you think that, but putting aside the way it's been used by politicians, do you think that affecting Japanese people and and politics. I mean, at, around the time th this election, if it became clear this election was going to happen. Uh, you know, there was lots of alarms going off and, and people supposed to be hiding under desks or whatever they were supposed to be doing. And it got great play in the media. But I had the strong sense that most Japanese people didn't really take it seriously, that they probably saw it as rather ridiculous, which it was, but it's given that these objects were 700 miles in the air, actually in outer space. <laughs> well, if you go by the markets, the likelihood that Tokyo is about to be wiped off the map is somehow not reflected in any prices on the Tokyo Stock <laughs> Exchange. Uh, or at least if they've been priced in, they've been priced in in a very, very cam camouflaged way uh, with, with highs for the, for the uh, so in that regard, I'm being flippant again, I'm sorry. Um, but in terms of, of fears, uh, I have had to, you know, um, to put in an anecdote, which is not really data, it's, well, it's hand-tooled artisanal data. Uh, to an anecdote, I've had to explain, uh, to work through the logic of deterrence with my students for the first time, saying, no, you're not going to die before the paper is due. Uh, you, th there is not going to be a missile coming here because, and you work through, well, you see, there's the, the, this, the, the, in return for a strike, there will be an overwhelming destruction uh, of, of the DPRK. That's, so don't worry about it. Uh, and then they say, well, what if there was a mistake? And, and, and what if there was a misunderstanding? And I say, yeah. Uh, and we survived the PRC and the uh, Cultural Revolution there and with, there, with a similar situation. So we're still here. Relax. <laughs> uh, I've had to do that, though. So there is an, an atmospheric change. And there, of course, having these warnings, having uh, the government actually playing up with these public service announcements, what you should be doing in case a missile float, of course that's going to change on the margins mm -hmm. uh, certain kinds of attitudes. But nevertheless, Japan does not have a means of di disarming uh, the DPRK. End of the game, end of the story. So we can't think about it. There's nothing to do. And, and for all the concerns about Washington, none of it's really translated into, I think, real uh, serious questions about the efficacy of the nuclear umbrella. And that, you know, so that until you actually get to the point where, you know, and, and, and I don't even know, and I don't know if there's anything 
short of the U.S. not actually coming through in the event of a crisis that would really lead to, you know, other than the U.S. saying, actually, no, there's no nuclear umbrella or, you know, a crisis happening and, and the U.S. failing. I don't know what it would take, um, certainly at a public level, for people to really say, okay, the status quo is not working anymore. I mean, I think maybe at the elite level, on the margins, people are starting to really wonder, um, you know, what that means. But, you know, in, in terms of a, of a kind of public about face when it comes to you know, how Japan thinks about nuclear weapons or, or um, any, I mean, we're, that I, I think that's still, um, you, know, there, you know, the air of unreality around that, I think, is still, is still actually quite strong. And then there's the question of the buy-in, the emotional buy-in that Mr. Abe is trying to do regarding the, the abductees. Mm -hmm that he has, he, he's the, the horse whisperer whispering in Donald Trump's ear, please put in your new end speech the story of the sweet 13-year-old girl who was abducted from her beach, uh, the, her, her home. Uh, and it, it makes its way in the UN speech, and now we find out that when he comes in November, he's scheduled to meet with the abductee families. Uh, that is a, uh, a signal internally, domestically, that the U.S. is on our side. They understand how we feel and that they're there for us. Now, that's just purely internal signaling, and I think it has a deleterious effect on the international politics of Japan, but that's my own personal view. But nevertheless, we see Mr. Abe pursuing that uh, at the cost of, uh, of I don't know, what, what he's giving up in return. Hmm. Okay, and Martin, make this the uh, last question, if you could. Well, that depends on you, I guess. <laughs> well, I suppose it is my job to make this the last question. So <laughs> this is the last question. <laughs> okay, uh, we are already talking about North Korea, war, and so on. I mean, let's go back to the beginning of the whole thing, the reasons for the dissolution of uh, the lower house. What are the real reasons? I still wonder. I mean, yeah, last week we had uh, Sochilo Tahara here at the club. And he told us uh, that uh, he was told by sources in the foreign ministry and the defense ministry that they were in favor of having a, a early election as soon as possible because they see a risk of a breakout of a war in, in Korea end of this year, next year. Uh, what do you think about uh, this way of, uh, what, have you heard about this? What do you think about this uh, background? Maybe it, is it something or is, it, is there nothing? Bureaucracies encourage entrepreneurism. They encourage people to come up with new ideas so as to compete internally for resources <laughs> uh, and for attention. Uh, <laughs> if there were forces within the inside MOFA or any other aspect, uh, or in, in the MOD, uh, that talked about the possibility of war, not this fall, but next year, uh, they would have a willing and, and, and eager ear in Mr. Abe. Uh, whether there is there doesn't even have to be a plausible scenario that makes that a reasonable proposal. If the, if the bureaucracy's own existence encourages that kind of behavior. Uh, and indeed, he was open to the idea the moment that his poll numbers went up. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I mean, this is the kind of thing that doesn't require, I, I mean, uh, you know, Occam's razor, I think, would suggest that you can um, find much simpler, well, and also, you know, the fact that um, during the run-up to Abe calling a snap election, the Democratic Party essentially was dissolving. I mean, it was, you know, that people were leaving, and who knew, um, you know, how, I mean, who wouldn't want to fight an election against a party that could, that could barely keep itself together and actually, in fact, wasn't able to keep itself together um, once it was clear there was going to be an election? I mean, and I think, um, I mean, between his poll numbers rising and, and the opposition uh, falling to pieces, I mean, why wouldn't he call an election? Yeah, I, I must say I had a great deal of egg on my face from actually following the, the terms of logic, uh, looking at the LDP's uh, constitutional Revision Council led by Mr. Komura, who laid out an entire schedule for 2018 uh, for eventually leading to a referendum, and then three days later, Abe short circuits it. Uh, the, wh who's in charge? The vice, the, the vice president of the party or the president? Obviously, the president. Uh, but for, for those three days, I was telling people, no election this year, everything's off. Uh, and uh, 
then bang, the, the, the weekend came and I looked like a total fool. Uh, but they had a plan. Yeah. They had a plan for the entirety of 2018 to do the thing that supposedly is the most important thing for Mr. Abe, constitutional revision, and he dumped it. Yeah. Well, and he certainly put it, and he certainly put it at risk, at least for a moment, it seemed. I mean, now, you know, given that it's going to be pretty much status quo, I mean, there's not, um, you know, he, he seems to have dodged that. But I mean, that was, I was in the same place that I thought, well, okay, if they have this plan, um, you know, you certainly don't upend that by calling an election and risk not having the two thirds you need. And then you have to go back to the drawing board. Maybe you get it, but it becomes more complicated. Um, but yeah, I mean, I th I, that's why I think we can't um, understate the role that the opposition looking, um, you know, just, I mean, really just falling apart. I mean, and, and, um, you know, you know, I think we can ask maybe, you know, it was by design and, um, you know, that there was sort of a plan all along, you know, when Maya Hara sought the party leadership. But either way, um, I mean, it certainly created a window of opportunity for Abe that, I mean. He took advantage yeah, of. Yeah, I mean, to, you know, it was, it was good politics on his part. Okay, we'll um, call it a day there. Um, thank you very much, Tobias, Michael. Much appreciated. And... Um, it's a complimentary um, membership of the club for a year, so oh, come and fantastic. come and dine with us. And if you could give our guests a warm round of applause, please. <laughs> and we'll leave it there. Thank you. Mm -hmm.